science fiction. We make no guarantees, however, how long it will remain fiction. 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 All right, antediluvian salutations, all you cognonauts out there. Welcome back to Exofathom, the podcast that dares to explore the outer reaches of human understanding. I'm your host, Nick, and I am joined once again by my lovely co-host, Ayla. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> thank you for, for being here, and uh, thank you guys for watching um, just want to let you guys know that you will be able to watch this in the future at uh, Thinkering Space, also here on our Thinkering Talks Facebook page, and over on YouTube at uh, Thinkering. Uh, I believe that's just Thinkering. Yeah. Um, we're also on Spotify and all the other podcatchers as well. Um, so please feel free to leave us a comment, leave us a like, uh, maybe even share it if you if you really like it. Um, but other than that, just thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, so today, well, to this evening, I should say, um, we wanted to get into the Atlantis legend. Now, for those of you who may not be aware, the Atlantis legend is a, a roughly 23... 2300 year old uh, allegory from the Greek philosopher Plato. Um, and so let's see, I can just break this down real simple in a blurb. Atlantis is a fictional island mentioned in the allegory on the hubris of nations in Plato's work, Timius and Critias, where it represents the antagonist naval power that besieges ancient Athens. The pseudo historic embodiment of Plato's ideal state in the Republic. Uh, in the story, Athens repeals the Ad uh, re repeals, repels the Atlantean attack unlike any other nation uh, and supposedly bearing witness to the superiority of Plato's concept of a state. Uh, the story concludes with Atlantis falling out of favor with the deities and submerging into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, what's kind of cool and I'm maybe not cool, but, uh, it's interesting how long Atlantis has been around and how and it still kind of sticks in our psyches. And I think that's a testament to Plato and his ability to play with archetypes and like the concept, uh, Ayla, you had mentioned the con concept of a utopia or a nation state. Uh, is one that kind of sticks with us throughout the generations. And uh, I think he did a very good job at at uh, creating sort of a a parable of a outside nation that, that comes to threaten yours. Now, that's kind of different from what the Atlantis we hear more modernly. Uh, and we're going to get into the differences between those two Atlantises. But Ayla, do you have anything to add or do you want to say anything before I get into the, the Plato's version of everything? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think we're in for a very interesting hour. Um, the Atlantis theory, it kind of goes into so many different directions. And I think it's just such a fun concept to play with, you know, um, Definitely the idea of it being this kind of utopia and also a beacon to, oh, my television decided to be possessed by a ghost. Can you hear that? <laughs> no, uh -huh. but maybe just, yeah, <laughs> shut, shut it off. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me, guys, yeah, um, which is funny. <laughs> well, and I was just going to say um, one of the markers of Atlantis, and I know you'll get into this, um, but they talk about the technology that it had. It was very advanced and forward thinking. Um, mm. And just kind of reflecting on that and how even back in Plato's day, that was something of a benchmark for utopia status, you know, I mean, right. among a bunch of other things. But mm. um, yeah, no, I mean, I 
the literary device, Atlantis is super interesting. And then you get into other, you know, myths and theories, and that's interesting too. So I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Let's just jump right into it then. So according to Plato, and this is we're going to jump right into Plato's allegory of Atlantis. We get into the more New Age mythology of Atlantis because see how they're kind of different things. And then at the end of the we're going to talk about and even give you guys a possible location for Atlantis. So uh, and uh, deep into that uh, shortly. But first, we're going to hit the uh, Plato's representation of Atlantis so that you guys have a little bit of background on the legend. It's um, so here we go. Uh, the legend of Atlantis owes itself uh, Greek philosopher Plato in two of his writings and dialogues of Timius and Critias, written around 350 BCE. There are short descriptions of Atlantis as part of a story about a lawmaker of Athens, Solon, which took place in Egypt. Um, now, in Timius, and it's it's really interesting because Atlantis in, in Plato's works isn't that big. You would think that for a legend that spans so much time, that Atlantis would be much more fleshed out, but there really are very small mentions of this in Plato's uh, Timius and Critias. And so here is the reference uh, in Timius. Uh, let's see. For it is related in our re records how once upon a time your state stayed the, uh, a course of a mighty host, which, starting from a distance, in the Atlantic Ocean was insolently advancing to attack the whole of Europe and Asia to, Asia to boot. For the ocean there was at the time navigable, for in the front of the mouth of which you Greeks call, as you say, the pillar of, pillars of Hercules, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together. And it was possible for travelers at the time to cross from it to other islands and from the islands to the whole of the continent over against them, which encompasses that veritable ocean. For all that we have here lying within the mouth of which we speak is evidently a haven having a narrow entrance, but that yonder is the real is a real ocean and the land surrounding it may most rightly be called, in the fullest and truest sense, a continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, where exist, uh, there existed a confederation of kings of great and marvelous power, which held sway over the, all the islands, and over many other islands also and parts of the continent. Um, so I think what stood out to me here is that it, Atlantis kind of serves as this uh, proverb of the foreign threat um, of, or, or maybe the allegory of the great unknown, what lies beyond civilization. And so perhaps that's why it's stuck with us for so long because it really, you know, like hinders or not hinder hitches itself on that archetype. Um, Ayla, do you have any thoughts about that? <laughs> you know, um, I would, I would, but I had muted my mic while you were reading, and the minute I unmuted it, our dog jumps on the couch and farts. Oh no! <laughs> so well, I'm totally thanks, useless for the moment. Yeah, and she's staring at me. Um, but to, to add to what you were saying, um, because I was totally listening. Uh, it. I mean, I was reading this beforehand too, and I do think it's interesting that you would have, um, you know, the great kings and they're fleshing out um, just kind of like the location. So specifically, you know, having a narrow entrance. I don't know what that leads to the story, but I'm, I'm interested to think about what Plato had in mind for kind of his vision and why he created it the way that he did, you know? Yeah, certainly. And I think it did. I did. I think it definitely did have something to do with because in the, in the paragraph, he talks about how what they know as their society is in but a narrow inlet and then outside the pillars of Hercules were were was the open world. This the, you know, the, uh. the unknown, you know, and so 
inside Greece, inside Plato's Greece was the bastion of, of modern society and wisdom and, and high culture. But in the outside, the outside of Greece, past the pillars of Hercules was this unknown threat that was slowly massing more and more power, which I think is a, an interesting sort of concept if you think about it in like terms of uh, Lord of the Rings per se, how Sauron is in, you know, in, in the fires of Mount Doom amassing an army that is only rumored about, but, you know, still persists. And uh, yeah, I think that that's kind of like an ancient sort of tale. Oh, yes. Well, and um, I think you and I have talked a lot about Pandora's box and what came out of it. Um, I think fear, was it fear and panic was the first thing to come out or what was, mm. what's the mythology on fear and panic? I mean, they're like very fundamental elements, I would say. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, God, uh, there was a God, um, pan who the word panic comes from. Um, and he was the satyr God, the goat man God that, uh, um, basically would cast a spell on you in the woods and make you extremely afraid. That's where the word panic came from. Mm. Um, but further than that, I do believe that part of the woes that Pandora lifted upon or, you know, let out upon the world were, was definitely uh, a part of that. Uh, we can, we can probably get into that in a, in a whole episode on Greek mythology. Cause there's so much, so much there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think it's uh, it's interesting because, you know, every idea builds on another idea. And I mentioned them because I think it is interesting to have this idea of an army brewing um, that you can't see, but you just are rumored, you know, you hear rumors about it. And I, mm -hmm. it's just interesting because even like today, in today's age, you know, you can have the rumor mills pop up and what your mind kind of fills in for the gaps can be a really big difference than what's actually happening. Um, and just in that tale too, yeah, I mean, that's just interesting to have this other concept, this, this foreign civilization, like you said, just growing and growing and how that alone can create some sort of tension just by it being there. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's the, the choosing of knowledge over, you know, ignorance perhaps, but uh, let's get on to Critias because he uh, speaks a little bit more about Atlantis. Um, he says, uh, first of all, let me begin by observing um, that 9,000 was the sum of years which had elapsed since the war, which was said to have taken place between those who dwelt outside the pillars of Hercules and all who dwelt within them. This war I am going to describe of combatants on one side, the city of Athens was reported to have been the leader and to have fought out the war. The combatants on the other side were commanded by the kings of Atlantis, which, as was saying, uh, was a uh, was an island great in extent, greater in extent than Libya and Asia, and when afterwards sunk by an earthquake became implausible or impassable barrier of mud to voyagers sailing from hence to any part of the ocean. Um, so that gets a little, that alludes a little bit to the greater myth. And I'm not exactly sure if the, if the Greek myth of Atlantis that I'm about to describe uh, next because of what Plato said, or it's the inverse. Um, so take that with a grain of salt because I'm not exactly sure which mythology came first, which, whether it was Plato referencing Atlantis and then this mythology came from it, or if it was previously already kind of in, installed and they named it Atlantis. So um, I'm going to go on here and get into the Greeks uh, mythology of Atlantis, which is not very long. It's quite short. Um, it says, according to the legend... Atlantis was home of the god Poseidon, the place that was initially given to him when the gods divided the world between themselves and each ruled his, uh, his or her own territory. Poseidon formed the island and lived there with his wife and children. Poseidon created an alternate, or he created alternate round zones of water and land so that the center of the island was surrounded by water and not to be accessible by man. 
He had ten children and thus divided Atlantis in ten portions. Atlas was Poseidon's firstborn son, and Atlantis got the name from him. Atlantis was an advanced civilization, rich and prosperous with everything in abundance, a paradise, according to Plato. The inhabitants were, were a great power who opposed even Europe and Asia and were able to navigate the sea. A great fight is mentioned between the goddess Athena and the Athenians and Poseidon and the Atlanteans. With the help of Athena, the Athenians managed to win the battle and protect Athens against the Atlanteans. Generations lived one after another, with every king better than the one before. They reached the peak of their society and attained very high spiritual values, but human nature eventually got the upper hand. The values of Atlanteans became, uh, began to deteriorate, their behavior changed, and they even defied the gods. It was Zeus who, seeing how, honor, how, the, how an honorable race became corrupted, decided to punish them. Gathering the other gods, he decided their fate. The rest of the dialogue of Critias is lost. However, the end mentioned in Timius, where in one night, violent earthquakes and floods punish Atlantis and the whole island disappeared into the depths of the sea. So leave it to the Greeks to always have uh, tales of hubris and uh, humans cup come up in <laughs> at the time <laughs> of uh, at the time of greatness. Uh, cause they always manage to, anytime the humans have the upper hand, the gods get angry and, and decide to smite them. So every time as, as a God does, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's a couple things that I wanted to point out just off the bat. Um, Atlantis, uh, comes from the God Atlas, which was Poseidon's son. At, uh, Atlas is the God who bore the weight of the world on his shoulders. Um, which I think now in, in the new age sort of sense of Atlantis, um, the metaphor is that, you know, great people, you know, great power should have to carry a great load or there's great responsibility within that. Um, next, I think is interesting is that Athena is the goddess of wisdom and obviously the patron god goddess of uh, the Ath Athenians. Um, so in essence, uh, <laughs> fights against wisdom and loses which in itself through the play of their gods it kind of reveals a moral story of, that if you fight against the, your you know common wisdom or what is true you're always going to fail hmm. you, I can second anything? that yeah. 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 No, I would. I would co-sign that. Sorry, I was just trying to uh, not cut you off. We have a little bit of a time lag, guys. Oh yeah. Um, so I will be a little extra thoughtful in my responses with with long pauses. But um, I I like the legend. First of all, I have to say, Timius and Critias. If you have two dogs or two animals that need a name, those are pretty good complimentary names. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, these um, gods smiting people for, I mean, like, first of all, my question is, how did they defy the gods? Like, I'm just curious what started going down in Atlantis that the gods all, all of a sudden were like, okay, we're going to strike well, you down. Yeah. If you know Zeus from Greek, Greek mythology, it doesn't take much to piss him off. So... <laughs> It could have very well been them not doing the proper sacrifices or, you know, I mean, he he's he's done a, in the mythology. He's done a lot worse for a lot less. So. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah, um, I was just reading the story about Medusa and how that all went down. But I won't mm -hmm. I won't get into that because he is very petty. Um, but what I do think is interesting in uh, in Japan, there's like a. I don't know, like a quote that I learned or some, it's like an adage maybe, um, but it was something like the tallest peg is the first to be struck down. And I feel like that's an interesting concept that you do see play out in a lot of mythology and a lot of stories. Um, the idea that you don't want to get too far. You don't want to like, I don't know what's the word. Like you don't want to rise too far. Otherwise you're going to fall very hard too, you know, 
um, the taller you are, the harder you fall. You have the Greek myth of the guy who tries to what fly to the sun and then yeah. he gets burned. Um, and so I think that's just interesting. Yeah, because, you know, all humans, we would love to have a utopia. I mean, most of us would. Um, but then to think also, too, that it's in our psyche that once we get there, we can't get too far. Otherwise, we'll be, like, knocked down. I don't know if that's a takeaway or not, but I just, that came to mind when you were reading. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, well, and I think the takeaway, too, is that, yeah, I mean, if you get too far, you can be brought down, but normally it's yourself that brings you down because of your pride. So mm -hmm. the parable of Icarus that he, in his pride, flew too close to the sun and the wax in which his wings were sealed, melted, and he fell to his death. So it's, it's, it's the concept that yeah, the gods may not exist, but Icarus didn't need gods in order for that to happen, you know, because mm -hmm. what he did was build a pair of wings and, and you know, or his father did rather, uh, wings and was warned, hey, don't get them too hot because the, the wax will melt and he didn't listen and that's what happens, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Atlantis, I mean, okay, so, and that makes sense, too. I guess I was thinking just more on, like, a larger scale, like, because it could be hubris. In this case, I don't know, do you think, like, like the jealousy of the kings was at play there, or? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure, because there's not very much, um, there's not very much story to tell. Uh, we only get bits and pieces from what the Greeks have written, and this is basically all the information that you can get. A lot of Greek myths are like this, too, where it's like they'll give you a, a two-paragraph myth, and it's like you kind of have to extrapolate from there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, do you have anything else to add there, Ayla, or do you want me to get on to new age stuff <laughs> no. yeah I, yeah i think we can move on i mean i i feel like we'll probably circle back to this later too yeah certainly yeah once we get into allegory we can go crazy so uh, <laughs> <laughs> so running uh you know after plato's myth the concept of atlantis kind of became lionized as this um like ayla said like a utopia of sorts in which um, many civilizations either tried to replicate or tried to find. Um, this happened uh, basically through the ages, especially during the, um, the exploring ages of Europe. Um, there was some thoughts by early explorers that Europe, or that Europe, that Atlantis would be where the Americas are. Um, they honestly thought that America was Atlantis at some point. Um, took them a while to figure out that that was it was its own place, and <laughs> it wasn't the mythical island that they were looking for. But um, nevertheless, there has always been this sort of uh, propensity within the you know throughout history for people to look for Atlantis or try to place Atlantis. It's the same sort of idea with the myth of El Dorado in South America. Um, this kind of, like Ayla said, again, I'm going to say utopia <laughs> in which everything that you could ever want is there. And it's hidden from man to keep away the evils that, you know, man would, would um, unleash upon it with being given all that power, you know. So in essence, uh, the uh age sort of modern mythology that that we kind of are more familiar with but you might not be familiar with the whole story um kind of started with one lady um a russian mystic named uh, helena petrova or petrovna blavatsky my gosh um and her <laughs> partner henry Steele olcott uh, founded their Theosophical Society in the 1870s with a philosophy that combined Western Romanticism and Eastern religious concepts. 
Blavatsky and her followers in this group are often cited as the founders of the New Age and other spiritual movements. Uh, she maintains that the Atlanteans were cultural heroes, contrary to Plato, who describes them mainly as a military threat. The theoth uh, theoth oh my gosh, that's going to be so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Theosophists <laughs> believe that the civilization of Atlantis reached its peak around 1 million uh, years ago and 900,000 years ago, so somewhere in that 100,000 years. Um but destroyed itself through internal warfare brought about by dangerous use of psychic and supernatural powers of the inhabitants. So that's quite different, but not really that different because if you think, you know, the Greeks understanding was that Atlantis was also kind of run by the gods, they presumably would have had supernatural gifts as well, I would think. Oh. You think, Ayla? Fun fact. I mean, <laughs> possible. <laughs> possible yeah exactly uh let me go, go on here it was uh madame blavatsky and the, the theosophical movement who first pre pre uh, presented the spiritual teachings of the world regarding Le atlantis and lemuria chiefly in blavatsky's work the secret doctrine it would be works like this that built the foundation for the new age version of the atlantis myth more mythology and story added to this new spin until an entirely new but same legend was created the new age atlantis legend or i like to call it atlantis with lasers that's <laughs> a little bit more but catchy. Does it have lamps <laughs> yeah yeah oh they have laser lamps actually <laughs> so well i'm the sold. best of both worlds <laughs> Yeah, um, Nick has his show notes up and he added a little comment underneath that says, we will have to cover Madame Blavatsky in a separate episode. And I agree. I didn't oh, yeah. even know this woman existed. What? Oh, she's a trip. <laughs> yeah, she's she's real trippy, man. She's got a fascinating story. Yeah. Gosh, have there been, has she, has her character been featured in any popular movies or? I don't think so. That I might know of? I honestly, I really don't think so. Um, she's kind of like a kind of like a background figure, and I think it, unfortunately it was because she was a woman. But she's very, very fascinating. Um, yeah, so well, we'll definitely do an episode on her in the future because she's she's had a lot of she's had a lot of influence on the same things that we see today. You wouldn't know that she was the one that came up with them. So, well, also anybody that found their very own society i mean you gotta give them like a lot of credit there i mean what like first of all i want to create my own society and i don't even know what that means does that mean that she just created like kind of like a book club for her own book or well, is it like they do events and stuff i mean yeah we have to talk more about her i'm very intrigued now <laughs> well yeah uh no i mean when we talked about ghosts in a couple episodes ago i mentioned how the there was an, a, a craze for the occult yeah back in that time she mm -hmm. was one of the people that started it so no yeah, so it'll be an interesting episode for sure. But let's get to Atlantis yeah. with lasers. So okay, yes, Atlantis <laughs> with lasers. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> but yeah, so forgive me. This is going to be kind of a long-winded um, story, but I, I promise I will let if a anything to say. She's feel free to say something because you, you're going to get bored listening to me talk this whole time. But bear with me. Um, I'm going to get through this uh, this new age legend it's a lot longer it's more fleshed out but then we'll get into locations and then talking about the deeper allegory and metaphor all I'm right so here we go because I was, oh well i was what just gonna add one little thing i said i might not interrupt you because when i was reading this it's pretty out there and i'm just thinking to myself well this is it's just it's just so entertaining to read and just think about so with that Oh, yeah. Well, it is certainly out there and I will do my best to not butcher <laughs> it. So just bear with me. Thank you guys for listening again. And I appreciate your patience. I read like a toddler. So I appreciate you listening. Um, here we go. This with lasers. Uh, in the golden age of uh, Atlantis, the civilization was so advanced that they, along with their continental counterparts, Mu and Lemuria, were welcomed with open arms to the Galactic Federation. 
a collective of advanced alien beings that shared technology and wisdom in an effort to spread enlightenment through the universe. Atlantis, Mu, and Lemuria became pinnacles of utopianism. Claims of millennia of peace and abundance permeated the modern Atlantis myth, as well as an incredible claims of mystic technologies. According to the legend, it was like paradise, with the temperature approximately 27 degrees Celsius throughout the or 27, 25 degrees Celsius throughout the year. The ground contained many volcanoes and was therefore fertile. Atlantis reached the highest development level uh, that ever existed on Earth, much higher than us now, both spiritually and technologically. People lived as one with nature and with the creatures from higher realms and other planets. The airspace was controlled with all kinds of airplanes, which are discussed in the oral traditions of old Sanskrit texts and peoples across the world, such as the Hopi and other Native American tribes, the Irish, the Celts, and the Indians. Um, people also built submarines and computers. There was free energy from sunlight and quartz crystals, and there was a type of television system. I don't know why they added that in there, but <laughs> I'm taking a lot of this from from other accounts. So <laughs> bear with me. You mean um, they had Netflix? Also? I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe Atlantean Netflix. Uh, I don't know. Um, oh man. Um, only natural materials were used, and everything that was no longer needed, such as waste, was recycled or de dematerialized. Throughout the year, there were many celebrations and ceremonies, such as solstices, uh, to celebrate this the love and unity with each other and Mother Earth. The fertile lowlands of Maine Atlantis Islands were almost 200,000 square kilometers large and were provided with perfectly fun functioning irrigation systems, which also served as a transport system. Here, the farmers and gardeners worked in perfect harmony with nature to feed over the over 200, or two, 20 million souls of the population. They understood the art of communication with the Davic kingdom, or spirits of nature, which meant they knew exactly how to get the most from every crop. Crystal energy was used everywhere in Atlantis. Under the influence of sunlight, starlight, and ethereal psychic energy, crystals create unique tremors that resound to each other over large distances. So no, cable, uh, no power cables were needed either. Crystal is also beautiful to see, so this fits in perfectly with the gorgeous cities and temples that Atlanteans created. With the Temple of Poseidon in the capital of Caledocian as the highlight. Caledocian, built up out of circles and, with also, and also located on the lowlands, was probably one of the most beautiful cities that ever existed on Earth. It was therefore often indicated as the City of Golden Gates or the Emerald City. In regard to personal care, crystals were used for healing wound, wounds and the chakra system, for rejuvenation, rejuvenation cures, astral travel, and much more. Industrial crystals were used in society to create favorable energy fields for, among others, agriculture and in, form, or in order to form interdimensional tunnels. The buildings of tunnels to the ho hollow earth by dissolving earth material and some sort of laser technology. There we go with your lasers, Alan. Lasers! <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I th let's hear a little bit more about the crystal power grid that they use to you know, uh, power the island. For the benefit of the power network, crystals had to be set up through Atlantis in a triangular formation called posers. They were interconnected via a flattened copper bar under a spherical dome, which could be turned around to receive specific stellar sun and gravitational wave energies. This system supplied homes, offices, media, and theaters with power, as well as factories, medical centers, schools, and companies. 
Well, this sounds very cosmopolitan. Like Atlantis is like hustling and bustling, huh? Seriously. They got movie theaters. <laughs> they have TVs and movie theaters. Yeah, you would think factories. in advanced society wouldn't you need those things. But bam, maybe mm -hmm. they just maybe they just like it, right? Oh yeah. Plus they have just like astral travel. Like I just picture their doctor's office with crystals and chakras and they have like a little sensory depth tank. You just yeah. Have everywhere <laughs> you see souls like the jetsons flying through the air yeah. oh my gosh yeah i know well it's it's a trip and okay so let's see uh during what is called the golden age life must have looked quite odd according to our standards interaction with higher creatures and extraterrestrials was something completely normal Various spaceships th uh, flew through the night or through the sky, and light beings without a body were a daily sight. Uh, let's see. Who evolves spiritually also or often also learns to communicate with the world around them, both with living beings and with matter that most of us regard as lifeless. This way, the priesthood Atlantis uh, of Atlantis could raise their vibration of a material like a stone with their mind so that it almost became unsteady. This made it behave in a more liquid manner and became much lighter. The priests were able to use or to able just using their hands or a simple tool to take large, perfectly fitting blocks of stone from the rocks and build walls or pyramids with it. That kind of sounds like the um, the Hemi sync we were talking about in the uh, oh yeah in the other series. Oh yeah, no, there's a couple things that kind of brought me to that. I was like, hmm, force mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. It's all about vibration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they go on to say, since they could also raise their own vibration, they could levitate themselves up uh, to oh, sorry up to ten meters above the ground if necessary. This ability was also used for travel. So now. Uh, so now and then you could see people flying through the air in Atlantis. So they could fly too. Why do they need stop? <laughs> why do they need airplanes? I don't. Did they mention airplanes? I guess they did, huh? Yeah. I guess perhaps only the truly gifted could tell, like you know, fly like that. So everybody else had to had to yeah. travel the other way, or maybe it just was too much energy. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't all have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's true okay well so now that we got a picture of what the ideal atlantean civilization was like what we really want to know about is what happened to it right so things are going to get towards descript the description of the fall and how that came up uh, about according to this new age myth so here we go the fall uh things started going wrong at the beginning of the last twenty six thousand year cycle one that officially ended in 2012. Uh, as with everything that occurs in the universe, this was no coincidence. This cycle was destined to be dual because souls can le uh, learn from a society which contains both good and evil. In practice, this meant that negative aliens such as reptilians started interfering with Earth and meddled with the highest leaders, the high priests. By now, Atlantis had broken apart into multiple islands due to various volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, and the leaders of one of these islands turned out to be susceptible to alien temptations. Ooh. <laughs> so um, it doesn't necessarily explain very well, but apparently Atlantis was built on fault lines, and so it would occasionally get lots of earthquakes and it caused it from being a large mass to kind of break up towards the end into smaller islands. And apparently when those islands kind of were isolated from the mass, they started to gain their own autonomy and their own desires. And that's when the evil aliens were able to impose their will on some of the, you know, Atlantean Island dwellers. So, According to the story, due to the ability uh, Atlantis had to communicate with otherworldly entities, it came to pass that malignant social complexes began to invade the consciousness of the priesthood. This con complex preyed on the Atlantis ambition and began to warp it to their will. As soon as the priesthood came under influence of this male malevolent 
complex, they started to interfere with other civilizations more and more. According to Plato, and I don't think it's according to Plato, but <laughs> according to Plato, they built up an army of more and more, uh, more than a million people and had an enormous fleet, which ruled parts of North America and the Mediterranean area. Uh, the area uh, they learned how to split atoms and use intense solar energy and how to use these atoms to build nuclear bombs. This later destroyed the Asian empire of you and the ruins of two large cities, which used to be you now in Pakistan, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro are still radioactive today, apparently. So they're claiming that there's an era, this, this area that the Atlanteans nuked in Pakistan is still currently uh, uh, radioactive because of the nukes that Ad the Atlanteans uh, sent over there. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's it crazy. is a little crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's crazy stuff. Okay. So here we go. Approximately 25,000 years ago, the gen degenerate Atlanteans started arguing with the Lemurians about how the rest of the earth should be ruled. Atlantis wished to rule these civilizations, but Lemuria felt that they should be, uh, they should be at their own pace. The conflict reached such, such heights that the, Sons of Belial and their extraterrestrial partners decided to destroy Lemuria. Uh, in the middle of the night, one of the two moons Earth had at the time was dragged within our atmosphere by spaceships and blown up high above Lemuria. The pieces fell down on Lemuria while most of the inha inhabitants slept. The enormous tremors created by all this caused numerous underground gas fields to explode, which worsened the disaster. As a result, nearly the entire continent of Lemuria was ruined in a single night, and over 60 million Lemurians died. That's quite a death toll. I feel yeah. bad for those Lemurians. But there it's were like some that. that survived, and the ones that did sought asylum in Agartha just as those who had fled during the increasing conflicts, they were allowed in with the condition that they behave peacefully. Even now, many of the underground cities in Agartha's network still consist of Lemurian enclaves, such as the city of Telos underneath Mount Shasta in California. Until the end of the previous century, uh, they were regularly, uh, they still regularly came above to hold rituals. Once this area became too populous, they stopped these practices. Now, it's interesting because both Ayla and I visit Mount Shasta very regularly, and uh, we hear about these Lemurians all the time. I right? hate these yeah. love, they love talking about the Lemurians. <laughs> yeah, they really do. Seeing the Lemurians, hearing them, the lights on the mountain. Um, and so funny, I actually bought a book on ancient Lumeria maybe like a year or two ago. Mm. I still haven't read it. I keep trying to, but it's so, I think maybe now I could do it now because I didn't have like a um, kind of like a timeline to kind of attach it to. Um, but no, I mean, gosh, that's, that's really interesting. I didn't know that they called it the city of Telos and that they were so shy because it got too popular for them. Oh, yeah. The city underneath Mount Shasta is called Telos, apparently. Huh. Uh, yeah. So the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so in reference to the uh, Atlanteans, it goes on. They showed uh, they also showed increasingly less respect for Mother Nature, with which they had up until then always lived in harmony. They use their genetic knowledge to set up cloning programs to develop low developed slave race that could do all the dirty work for, on their island. Uh, in addition, human and animals were merged together, leading to creatures including centaurs, mermaids, and the Yeti. As, many, uh, as with many myths and legends, these stories are based on actual facts. The two latter creatures, mermaids and yeti, still live on today in small groups, far away from modern civilization. Animals around today, such as the cheetah and the panda, are also consequence of genetic experiments from long, long time ago, just as various crops like bananas. 
What do they have against bananas, pandas, and cheetahs? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> bananas, pandas, and cheetahs are all genetically modified clones from from Atlantis. Apparently, that's a T-shirt right there. <laughs> Maybe that's why we're so we're so uh, you know we're so dead set on keeping pandas around, right? Because yeah. they're like the last genetic remnant of the Atlantis civilization. Yeah, pandas. Yeah, they're. <sighs> You know, I love pandas, but the more you learn about pandas, the more you just realize that they shouldn't exist. Like, how yeah, they're are they really, still They're alive really today? dumb. <laughs> like, they just, they, they don't, they don't serve a purpose. They eat bamboo, which is, has no nutrition, so they don't really do anything. Like, and they have to eat a ton of it. I think they have to eat, like. It's an awful life. Yeah, yeah, and they're just, like, napping and eating all day. Yeah. I, have you seen those pandemic panda uh, memes that have been going around? No, no. It's like um, in a pandemic, you sit around and eat all day, similar to the panda, which is why we call it a pandemic. <laughs> the internet's very proud of that one, I'm sure. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. I think it's so funny. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but I don't know about the banana. I mean, well, actually, I'm I'm remembering something. My high school class, we were able to do one experiment, uh, budget cuts. And so what we ended up doing, um, I guess the teacher rented a centrifuge and we took bananas and we somehow extrapolated the, the genes from the, I don't know, I don't remember very much, but basically bananas have really large genetic ladder systems or structures. So you can actually see them unlike others under a microscope. And I also heard that the banana's like ladder system is really similar to humans somehow. That that might not be true, but I feel like something about that. I remember the banana being like a particular fruit that had a special property opposed to other fruits. So maybe it was genetically modified. Yeah, maybe. And it's also a berry. So, so what? Like, um, yeah, a banana is technically a berry. So if you call it a fruit. That's not right. Wait, no, it's a berry. Well, it berry? is a fruit. I mean, it's also a fruit. Oh, it's a berry. Berries are fruit, but it's a it's a berry. It's not a. I don't know. That's what they consider it, anyways. Uh, I digress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. let me uh, get through this. We're almost done, actually. I'm in the last last couple of paragraphs of this new age myth. Um, okay, so like the banana, blah blah blah. Um, <laughs> in, in their urge to achieve technical superiority and rule the world. The corrupt leaders of Atlantis managed to take over the management of the crystal energy system uh, from the children of the law of one, which I believe is like the authority of the Galactic Federation. So they are like the on top dogs. You know, if 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 you have smart aliens, then you have the aliens that are super smart and they're the ones that that are, you know, all knowing and benevolent and you know, want to do good. Well, these Atlanteans tricked them and took away their crystal energy system. And with this oh, you system, can't do that. yeah, right. With this, no. with this system, they, they intended for, you know, peaceful objectives. They used this high, a uh, huge crystal satellite, which hung high above Atlantis and this spherical object with a diameter of over eight kilometers had been made that help of extraterrestrial uh, technology and provided the various energy systems of the ground with all the correct feed uh, um, with the correct feed all day. Let's see. Once the satellite fell uh, the uh, into the corrupt Atlanteans hands, however, they used it to create deadly lasers with which they attacked the European and Asian peoples that resisted the Atlantean domination. The result was that the satellite was overloaded and not much later it crashed the entire system, leading to an unprecedented series of disasters and explosions. Atlantis slowly began uh, being reclaimed by the sea as a result, but it is said that there are those who were able to flee and spread throughout the world, eventually ruling their own societies, ancient Egypt being one of the most prominent examples. So the idea is, is that Atlantis didn't sink into the ocean overnight like Lemuria did. It actually took some time for it all to fall apart. So there were there were uh, Atlanteans that were able to flee as well. 
And those Atlanteans went on to rule their own empires. And that's why we have great empires like the Egyptian Empire and the Mayan Empire, the Aztec Empire um, today. And the claim is, is that all of these great empires came from the Atlantean bloodline. Dude. And wait, so the people that are now, wait, that's okay. Just let that hang in the air for a minute. That is a lofty claim. Whew. That is some stuff. I'm just trying to process like if that were true. And I'm like, just trying to think backwards. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, I mean, look, it's a, it's a myth, but if we're going to play, you know, if we're going to play like it's real, it would make sense that, you know, if we can't, we, we have very hard time conceptualizing the construction of the great pyramids of Giza of conceptualizing, you know, Machu Picchu in, in Peru, um, all of these megalithic sites that, that, don't really make a whole lot of sense to us. I mean, it would, I mean, to make sense if we're trying to be, you know, if we're trying to follow this mythology that the descendants of Atlantis with knowledge of, of, you know, complex technology were able to go across the world and share that technology with perhaps the others living in the world and create these great empires. And not piss off the children of the law of one, or the is that were was that the extraterrestrials that that the Atlanteans tricked? No, it's who we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's them. But see, the, the the thing about the thing about these, you know, like high dimension extraterrestrials, is that they don't take action. They are merely just objective watchers, and so. Yes, the, you know, the children of the law of one are like the arbiters of, of the Federation. But when you're in that higher density, you feel no need to, to finish. And so the logic is that, yes, you know, the Atlanteans tricked all, tricked these aliens. Um, but there is no sort of vengeance except for maybe the Atlantis falling apart. But um yeah i don't i don't think that they stuck around long enough to see you know where the descendants of atlantis would follow i think maybe they came back once in a while um mm -hmm. but it, it it would seem to me that maybe the connection to the alien died with the civilization or i don't know maybe the connection to aliens died when cosmic spaceships dragged one of our moons down to earth and crushed all of was it Lumeria? I mean, did I read that wrong? No, you read that right. That was, but that was the Atlanteans that did it. So yeah, I don't know. Oh, was it their spaceships? Uh, maybe, maybe. I don't know if they had their own spaceships. Ayla, you're asking me a lot of questions about <laughs> about <laughs> something I I literally just read myself. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, no. Well, I was just trying to follow the um the logic here because. Yeah, I, I would be bit... careful about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. One, I will just say a side note. I had a dream one time that we had two moons. One was really, really close to our, our planet, much bigger. Um, and it was amazing. I loved the idea of two moons. Your whole tidal system was completely different. It was a long dream. Um, but I'm just interested... To, to read that because you have the concept of two moons and, you know, um, the new, in newish thought and stuff, moons are really associated with tides, with water. Um, and so you have a moon that collapses and then all of a sudden you have down the road. Well, I guess maybe not in this story. They don't talk about the flooding, do they? No, it just breaks up. Okay, so there goes that theory. I, I don't know. Yeah, there's not much logic here, but it's an interesting story, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I think it's, you know, basically there's there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, room for for expounding in Plato's sort of like simple little allegory that mm -hmm. it's only natural that we kind of try to fill in the gaps and explain certain things and um what I think is interesting between the two 
uh, stories is that it seems as though the New Age story really takes away the fairy tale that is what Plato was trying to accomplish. Uh, do you agree or no? Like, uh, it, can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, yeah. It would seem to me that the the New Age story is ta is is more one of of plight and and being manipulated instead of hubris. So instead of like, instead of like the Atlanteans bringing their own destruction upon them, more of a victim of the manipulation of some sort of outside entity that was evil that created the destruction of their civilization. So they're kind of like the victims. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm still like a little fuzzy on the Plato story because um, it it doesn't, it doesn't seem obvious to me what's with the water, what's the situation with the water, because it like it makes sense that there there was a war, and there was like tensions building. But why again? What happened? What did Plato say? Hold on, I'm gonna go backwards now. Hang on a second. Well, water is because the Greeks were a seafaring uh, people, and the pillars of Hercules were the 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 rock of Gibral Gibraltar, I believe. Um, Basically, the uh, the gate between the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, but so like, why did it sink, though? Well, Atlantic Atlantis sunk because they defied the gods. Because they became, uh, I don't mean they do, they don't go into in into incredible detail. But if you're going along with any sort of Greek mythology, then it usually comes from the hubris of the the human to get angry and vengeful so perhaps the idea yeah. is akin to that of um you know like you said icarus the the flying too high and being burned by the sun it's it's the concept that atlantis fell into the sea because they were trying to dominate the world and they you know were given so much great power and responsibility but they kept wanting more and they kept wanting to expand out farther into the world and farther into the, you know, like to consolidate more and more control, which is an affront to the gods and the gods get angry when mm. you try to, to take too much control and then you get punished for that. Well, and I think that's interesting to say, to call that out because in this new age um, tale, you know, in a lot of ways, the extraterrestrials could be viewed as the gods. Um, you know, in terms of just being an entity that's not of this earth, which I think is kind of an interesting way to merge or marry the two ideas. Um, oh, yeah, it definitely is. And I think yeah. there's a theory out there that all the Greek gods were, in fact, just extraterrestrials, which oh, I think is kind of a cool theory. Oh, oh, I dig it. I could see that. I mean, they would be really petty. Not what they're described yeah. in this new age. <laughs> yeah, you know, in here they're like all, um, you know, just pure souls. But yeah, if they were all Greek gods, I would be really fearful of our of our extraterrestrial counterparts out there. <laughs> oh, certainly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, vengeful. and uh, huh? They're vengeful. <laughs> oh, very vengeful. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They don't. They don't take no s. Um. So okay. So as you can see on our screen. This is an illustration of what they believed Atlantis would look like. And I think it's interesting that it's kind of like mirrored. It's Africa on the wrong side and America on the other side. Maybe I got a, like a mirror image or something. Um, but. Huh? Oh, no, it's just weird. It's like a weird shot of the map because yeah, yes. maps are really interesting. If you start looking at maps from all over the world. Um, you'll notice big variations in like the size of the continents, the placement, the text, um, and because it's all like catered towards that map maker's mm -hmm. country of origin or whatever. Um, so, like, if you anyway, that's that, that's a divergent theory. I'm I'm getting off the rails. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, that was the of the New Age myth. Now we wanted to get a little bit into where think the if Atlantis existed uh, this is probably the prime location number one and I will explain to you um, why I think so now for a long time it's been speculated about where Atlantis could have been a lot of people obviously say Atlantic Ocean because that's what Plato said some people think it's the Americas that was Atlantis 
Um, some people think that it was the Easter Islands. Some people think, you know, basically wherever you can find a megalithic structure or something like that, they speculate that there was probably some sort of Atlantean influence to it. But um, I think the most scientific hardcore uh, explanation or site that I can think of is the one in Africa, I believe it's in, I don't know if it's in Morocco, but it's called the Eye of the Sahara. And I will give you a picture of it. It's, not, it's actually called the Rish structure. Um, and this is structure right here. This is a satellite image um, of the structure in the Sahara Desert, in which I believe that this, if Atlantis exists, this is exactly where it was. Um, and I'll give you another shot here. Um, this is where it would be in respect to where Africa is and where the Atlantic Ocean is. Um, now, a couple reasons why I and a lot of other people, and it's not just me, I didn't make this up. So, you know, like I'm not doing any sort of groundbreaking investigation here. A lot of people think that this is the location for this. Um, so let me get into a little bit of an explanation for you, and then we can talk about the plausibility. Um, so it's called the reshot structure, um, and it is a deeply eroded, slightly elliptical dome with a diameter of 40 kilometers or 25 miles. Uh, the sed sedimentary rock exposes this dome range in age of late Proterozoic <laughs> within the center of the dome to Ordovician sandstone around its edges. The sedimentary rock composes this structure, dips outwards at a 10 to 20 degrees. Um, differential erosion of resistance layers of quartzite created high relief circular questas. That's what they are calling these uh, circular sort of like ringlets. Um, but I want to point out a couple things about that, that uh, paragraph there. Now, one of them was the circular uh, questas, which if you think about the Greek version of the, um, of the myth, Atlantis created little islands, uh, 10 islands to be exact, in Atlantis, or actually 10 rings of water um, to symbolize each one of his children. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. They also said that quartzite, they use a lot of crystals at Atlantis, right? Well, this is this particular area has a heavy, heavy deposit of quartzite. Um, hmm. Yeah. What do you think about that? That's nifty. That, <laughs> that's nifty. No, I, I mean, first of all, I've never seen this image. Um, and that's a really cool place. I don't know if um, you would know, but out of curiosity, is that like, um, is it an actual... Mm, like rubble from a structure or is it just the way that the geography like formed right there? Oh, like, what are we oh, looking let at? Get, let me get a little bit farther then. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause <laughs> I, I, I have a little bit more. This wasn't the only reason that people think that this is it. So oh. not only to that inf inter information, obviously we have the quartzite deposits, which we explain why they had crystalline technology, but also there are spectacular hydrothermal features are a part of the Rishat structure. They include the extensive hydrothermal altercation of rhyolites and gabbros, uh, and a central mega bre breccia uh, created by hydrothermal dissolution and collapse. So I don't know if you were re remembering the beginning of the myth, but the fertile oh, lands yeah. and the volcanic soil. Yeah. This area has hydrothermic uh, activity. So there's a the reason that it would have the same sort of minerals and deposits that volcanic activity would also have. Possibly. Maybe. Maybe. Possibly. I don't know. That's so interesting. No, wait, well, first of all, where's the volcano now? Is it like a. Oh, it would be underwater. They'd probably be. They're probably not uh, volcanoes, but hydrothermal vents or something like that, you know, like a geysers oh, or. Yeah aqueducts underneath uh yeah 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 geysers are weird that's like yellowstone right with the water mm -hmm. shooting out and it's just like a steam valve for a volcano system yep yep yeah do we know what volcano system that would be tethered to like what's the nearest volcano 
Oh, I, I have no idea. I'm, honestly, I don't know. Um, yeah. Let's see. There's a little bit more here. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. A 2011 multi-analytical uh, study on the Richat megabrechias uh, concluded that carbonates within the silica-rich megabrechias were created by low-temperature hydrothermal waters and that the structures required special proteins and further invest investigations of its origin. So to just think about what I, that just said. Low-temperature hydrothermal waters the ringlets of Atlantis, 10 ringlets, moats, waterways. This would be low temperature hydrothermal water, so it'd be like bath water. Yeah, I think in one of the stories, they were really specific, like, oh, it's only 57 degrees Celsius. At right, right. Day. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, how do you know? But um, that's so interesting. Yeah, huh. huh. Things that make you go, huh. And what part of um, do, can you zoom out again to show what part of the continent you're looking at? Or so it's kind of like northwest. It would be kind of like I guess under Morocco, North. maybe maybe Sierra. I don't know if that's like Sierra Leone or, or Morocco, but yeah. Um, that's so interesting. Well, just because like how landlocked. It is ah. to think about. Uh -huh. Oh, did I? Am I? Am I segueing into something else? Yeah, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> oh, hold on to your britches. What are you, cats and kittens, or whatever? <laughs> yeah, so you point out something very important that yes, it is. If this is supposed to be an island, why is it so landlocked? So let me just get through this one more paragraph about what that is, and then we can explain maybe possibly why. Atlantis is now on the land instead of under on the water. Um, so here we go. Artifacts, artifacts are found, typically redeposited, deflated, or both, in late Pleistocene and early Holocene, gravelly mud, gravelly gra uh, muddy gravel, uh, clay sand, and silty sand. These sediments are often cemented into either concretionary masses or beds of calcrete ridges typically typically consist of deeply weathered bedrock existing are uh, representing turn uh, truncated cenozoic paleozoic uh, that formed underneath or under tropical environments the pleistocene to middle holocene sediments uh, sediments occur along wadis as thin meter to less than a meter thick accumulations in the anterior annular depressions of three to four meters thick uh, accumulating along the waters of the out outermost annular depression of the Richard structure. The gravelly deposits consist of mixture of slope scree, debris flow, and fluvia fluviatile. That's a great word. Fluviatile. Fluviatile. Oh That's an awesome word. Um, Dang, or even, fluviatile. <laughs> yeah, or even torrential flow deposits. What? The the finer, uh, the finer grained sandy deposits consist of aeolian or eolian, yeah, um, or Playa Lake deposits. The latter contain well-preserved freshwater fossils. Num numerous concordant radiocarbon dates indicate that the bulk of these sediments accumulated between fifteen thousand years ago and eight thousand years ago during the African humid period. These deposits lie directly upon the deeply eroded weather bedrock. So, mm -hmm. what that said in a very mm, scientific -y <laughs> way was that <laughs> uh, this site has had obviously artifacts found, but also fossils found, but not that. artifacts that have been moved into that area by large flows of water. And the same thing with fossils. So, what I speculate and what I think we just we we should get into is the hypothesis of the younger Dryas impact. Now, Ayla definitely pointed out that in this photo here, Atlantis, if that's where it was, is obviously inland from Africa. Now, all we have to imagine is where maybe there was a point in which that water was farther inland 
uh, that would that would explain why that you know that it's that it's not in the ocean now. Um, the reason for that is that around fifteen thousand years ago, where these fossils date back to, and the deeply eroded bedrock date back to. It is hypothesized by a very intelligent geologist and scientist, Randall Carl Carlson, that around that time, a comet impact occurred um, that hit the North American ice sheet and melted all of the glacial, uh, the glacial sheet that was covering North, North America during that ice age. What, had, what happened was basically an instant ending of the ice age. The entire North American ice sheet was vaporized by this comet impact. There was a rush of water that uh, that would have surrounded most of the areas. Now, so what I think is possible is that perhaps at some point that air, that spot in Atlantis there could have been on the coast. So maybe that wasn't an island, but it was just a little coastal inlet that you could you know, go into what mm -hmm. is possible is that during the youngest dry, younger driest period, when that deluge of water inundated the world, Atlantis could have been swallowed by the sea. And then when the water receded again, as the glaciers started to form again, the site would be revealed to be on land where it would have been under mm -hmm. or on water. Well, and it's so interesting to talk about their um, agricultural systems because just the other day I read about um, somewhere in the world, they figured out how to do um, like saltwater agriculture. Mm. And it was really interesting because normally you do need to have to like have some sort of desalinization plant in order to make sure that you don't kill your plants. But somewhere they discovered that if you just play with the fertilizer, um, you can actually use salt water into it into a way that's not going to affect the root systems or something like that. Um, so, I mean, that's much more sophisticated because it's 2020 now. But I just think that's interesting if, yeah, if, if rising sea levels gave birth to a new opportunity in this little, like, coastal community or whatnot, that, that's just interesting. You know, I wonder what the conditions, like, would have been back then if that happened because no i'm saying that there was a that atlantis this area this area was a coast was a coast so that the before the the impact this would have been coastline and then oh, i thought you were saying okay the impact but, but happened and then it washed the entirety of atlantis over but so that's where we get the myth that Atlantis was swallowed by the sea. And that's why we have so many antediluvian myths is because that Randall Carlson, he hypothesizes around 13 or 15 to 13,000 years ago was a giant comic imp uh, comet impact. And that humankind had already had a quite an advanced civilization structure uh, set up before the impact. And what happened was once the impact happened, most of the advanced civilizations were wiped out and all that was left were hunters and gatherers that were able to survive. And they in turn found these sites again and recolonized them. Hmm. I'm only stuck on one part. Yeah. Are you still talking? Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm, I, this delay is just killing me. Um, I guess the only part that I'm curious about, and you can help me explain, because the comet comes down, and you said it melts the North American ice sheet. Yeah. So I was thinking that, like, this is how it looks, and then you get this comet, and then things melt, and then it goes underwater, and then it comes back again. No, I guess I see your point. I mean, it's it's just, it's hard to fathom because it's like you try to think like, okay, what's fact and fiction, and 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 what's all this stuff that's kind of like influencing and in like parallel situations or whatnot. Um, but that's really fascinating. I don't know. Um, I've 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 heard. Is it Graham Hancock that also yeah. talks about mm -hmm. this Grand idea Hancock of this, yeah. yeah of like old civilizations that 
got totally decimated and then they get built up again. And he theorizes that this has happened multiple times, which is yeah. really freaky to me. And the other thing is I totally believe that our, um, you know, because the geology is really cool. You can measure things with carbon dating. You can look at tree ring dating. Um, and you can even look at sediment rock because you'll have like more um, soot and ash during volcanic time. So you can use that to date things, correlate stuff um, by depth. But what I think is really interesting is in Arizona, we have these like mesas. And, you know, Arizona is super landlocked, super arid out there. And then you have these mesas really tall and then you go up to them and you can find seashells everywhere and my dad always would tell me that you know the the science yet just can't really explain why those seashells are there and you know in terms of like the the timelines and stuff so i think there's like a lot of catching up to do and kind of like going back and, and reevaluating things but that's all contingent upon being able to dig to a certain level which i don't think we can still do yet right like we can only dig like seven, eight, ten feet down for archaeological archaeological purposes, or is that no, wrong? No, certainly not. We take core samples much deeper. Do we now? Yeah, oh yeah, core samples go down miles. Yeah, we can take core samples of 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 you know, like in, especially like in Antar Antarctica and stuff. You can take core samples almost through the entire sheet of ice. I get. I'm gonna look into that more because I feel like. If that is the case, why aren't we? I mean, I guess you just can't dig up everything, and that's no. The, that's I mean, the I'm, a, I'm a, Randall Carlson does go through all that, and he goes through mm -hmm. core samples, and he goes through sediment and all that stuff. It's just the 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 issue is that academia has held this version of history forever, and if this gentleman Randall Carlson is right and there was in fact an actual you know advanced civilization that was wiped out by a comet impact then we have to write rewrite everything we have to rewrite everything so yeah. um i think there's more of a fear of the dissolution of the status quo than there is actually like oh we we just don't have the technology well actually we do we have a lot of science and if you guys want to check out his lectures on youtube uh, just check him out. Randall Carlson, he does slideshows, he does podcasts and stuff. And he, he's obviously well more, you know, well more versed than this than I am. So my feeble attempt at explaining it is probably not convincing very much right now. But please, I, I, I ask that you go, you know, hear, hear it from the horse's mouth because because honestly, you don't, you know, don't take my really terrible explanation as face value. He goes into the science and all of that. So um you know, I think it's incredibly possible that we have had civilizations in the past that get rebooted. Um, and it would go along with the allegories that we're talking about of how civilizations re the, reach this pinnacle of society. And then all of a sudden, every, the slate is wiped clean and mankind has to start over again. Well, maybe that's the reason why these stories stick in our head for so long is because they're cautionary tales given to us from, you know, our ancestors saying, hey, just so you know, at any point, this entire thing can get wiped clean and you'll have to start over. Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> now, he has a website, Sacred Geometry International. The world is our classroom. Have you uh, seen that one? No. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. He does have that website. Or something. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you said YouTube. So we'll, we'll post some links at the end. Um, and just as a side note, I was looking up bananas, and apparently, according to Newsweek, the world's bananas are clones. So, the more dun, you know. Dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff, it does sound really out there, but then you start kind of poking around, and I don't know. I think you just find some really interesting, groovy, new research that's coming out and if i'm looking at a picture of randall carlson i believe i've heard him talk before he is the most mild-mannered speaker and really interested in this stuff and i i remember it was a really it was a really fun time listening to him but you do oh, get he's really a, freaked he out he is like he's a geology nerd through and through you'll really enjoy yeah. it because he has he has a lot of enthusiasm about what he says and it's always contagious when people really love what they do so and and i think he's the one that told that was um talking about the ash clouds because he said that like 
you know, if you theorize that an asteroid hit and just blackened out the Earth, then it would stand to reason at certain depths you would see rock to support that blast. And then he went through and he showed some slides about that being the case. So, I mean, like, yeah, he does, he does do a really thorough job. I didn't realize that he said some of that other stuff, so I might have to go back and re-listen to him. Whew. Oh, yeah. Which brings us to the last little bit of our conversation here. Perhaps relevance you know uh, aspect of this and we've been kind of talking about it throughout so um the concept of atlantis being a more of an archetype and allegory than anything else and that's why it sticks around um we've already mentioned the concept of hubris um ayla also touched on the idea of utopia and um perhaps the cautionary tale there is that you is, is is a myth and and can never really be achieved because even when it is achieved it's taken away from you yeah well and gosh doesn't that have a lot of um like similarities with life right because you know it's like with anything if you have a goal you're working and working to get that goal and then once and you're worried about am i going to get it am i going to get it then once you get it you're worried about how do i keep it i don't want to lose it and i think that's so like from a singular person all the way out to civilization, yeah, utopia is the thing that you want to strive for, but keeping it is a whole nother thing entirely. And with a myth like this, I mean, not to be like pessimistic about it, but to be more about maybe releasing the idea of it and just enjoying the journey. You know, we've always heard that adage before. Um, because yeah, I mean, it's like, if it's a cautionary tale is the, is the goal to heed that advice and then just go. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I just thinking about it in terms of like just general kind of thoughts, but. Well, I think all of this wrote, you know, it, it, it applies both to the macrocosm and the microcosm. So, you know, like these, these types of stories stick with us for so long because they're so simple and they're basic and they're true. Um, that their truth is sort of like a intuitive truth instead of a literal truth, I guess. Um, so, you know, I think that that's why they're so important to us and they get brought up and they kind of get rehashed and we retell them over and over again because um, they not only apply to society, but they also apply to something within us as well. Um, and so, you know, the concept of utopia or perfection is is you know not just a societal issue it's also an inward issue like the concept of self-perfection and trying to get to yourself you know um the the uh the soul drive like you said the soul drive being the perfection isn't probably it's the journey to it or the striving of that is the actual point um because it's such an inattainable concept that the only point in it is to just reach for it and never actually touch it. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. That's totally where I was coming at it from. And, you know, I think it's interesting. Um, I think you taught me this word, actually. Dukkha? Mm -hmm. D-U-K-K-H-A? Yeah. Um, and it's just the concept of suffering. And, um, like, as a Buddhist concept, the idea is that human suffering is inevitable. So I just wonder, you know, to, to kind of pair that with this idea of maybe an idea of perfectionism or utopia and dealing with the idea that that's not going to happen. Oh, yeah. Well, and it could it even, <laughs> it, well, it could, it, it's, it's not even that, but the cosmic irony is that the, you're, in your pursuit of perfection, you are, you create your own destruction. Yes. And that's what's so elegant and beautiful about these parables is that they, as I said, they are more than just, you know, like literal truth. They're, you know, um, intuitive truth. So we know that that feels right. You know, that's why we love movies that have, catharsis in them that's why we love movies that follow the archetypes and the motifs and when they Underdog. decide to subvert our ex expectations game of thrones we get angry you know <laughs> <laughs> because we want our mythologies to be complete and whole so it's like it's like listening to you know four minutes and 40 or 39 seconds of a song and missing that one last bar of a song you know you feel like it's incomplete it's 
bugs you. It gnaws at your soul because there's no catharsis there. And I think that there's there's a need within us humans to to have stories that that not only make sense in a narrative way, but they, they are applicable to our lives and they're easily seen in the world around us. And to add to that, the psychologist Young, he always talks about archetypes and narrative and symbols and dream meaning. Um, so I think that that's really just interesting to highlight too from a psychological standpoint. We're understanding that these like icons or, or myths and stories have a real impact on our psyche and the way that we consider ourselves and our stories, the stories of those we love. Well, I think, it's, I think it's, yeah, I think they are us. I think that we cannot be separated from these myths. I think that, you know, if we really look at it, each and one, each one of these myths is a, is a facet of the human psyche that, you know, that, that, you know, that is put together to create the whole. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. I mean, cause it's getting at like the core of like raw human experience you go down to like the fundamentals of what we experience. And you can kind of see that reflected from the larger cell, so to speak. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, <laughs> I, that was quite a long one, uh, but I really uh, thank you guys for listening so much. Ayla, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? Um, I'm going to look into bananas a little bit further <laughs> now <laughs> before I eat them next time, and I'll report back if I have any more updates. Um, but, yeah, thanks for sticking with us and listening in. Um, I feel like so many of these topics start really – as these esoteric out there concepts. And then what I love so far is that when we talk about them and really kind of suspend our disbelief and just kind of sit with them, you'll find all these really interesting, relatable um, concepts to come out of it. So um, yeah, so I just hope you guys join us. There's so much more to talk about and reflect on. And especially in these dark times, it's kind of nice to just pause for a little bit and wonder. So thank you. Oh, yeah. And thank you guys again for listening very, very much. We really appreciate all that you do for us. And, you know, we're, we're trying to perfect our model and give you guys really good content. Again, I apologize for my reading skills. I will get better. I have dyslexia. I tend to jump four or five words ahead of a in a sentence, so I need to work on that. But um, thank you so much for listening. Please check us out at thinkering.space where you can catch all of our podcasts from Thinkering to Keelan's new podcast, If Numbers Woo! Can Talk, that's going to be coming out with a new episode soon. So stick to stick to Thinkering uh, Talks on Facebook for more information on when that will be available. Catch us on all of your uh, podcatchers. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, you guys. We really appreciate you listening. And uh, you guys stay out there. And we will catch you on the next ExoFathom. Good night. Good night.